Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods, moving, and storage studio, it's The Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create amazing relationships. I'm Ramsey personality George Camel, joined by my good friend and much smarter friend, Dr. John Deloney, and we are here to answer your calls about money, life, mental health, relationships, marriage, the boundaries that you don't have with your in-laws. It all happens right here in front of you on The Ramsey Show. So give us a call, 888 Kaylin joins us up first in Columbus. Kaylin, welcome to the show. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. How are you doing? Um, I'm really stressed, but hopefully you can help me. Oh, boy. We can try our best. John's here, and he always calms me. Okay, good. George says I'm his um, walking Xanax, so I can help. Let's do this. What's up? <laughs> All right. So my question is, should I? And if the answer is yes, how do I do this? Um, set boundaries with my mom in regards to her constantly asking me for money. Ooh, that one's hard. How long has this been going on for? Um, since I graduated high school, I'm 25. So um, like seven so years? A long time. Yeah, I, it got a little bit better because my sister moved in with her and I had been like paying for a lot of stuff, but my sister just got herself into a lot of credit card debt going on a vacation she couldn't afford. And so... Um, so my you're the functional one in the family. Yeah. And so they all come to you because they go, well, Kaylin's got her life figured out. We'll ask her for money and she'll Pretty give it to much. us because she's so sweet. <laughs> if your mom's uh, been yeah. asking you for money yeah. for seven years, that means you're giving her money for seven years. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the hey, last hey, hey, listen, hold on, hold on, hold on. Much, Kaylin, yes. <laughs> you have to quit beating yourself up. You love your mom. And it's yeah. hard to tell your mom no, especially when mom is violating what I would consider a core tenant of that parent-child relationship and using you almost predatorily. That's hard. So don't beat yourself up for that, okay? Like, you're okay. good. You've been doing the best you could to maintain that relationship, even though that's not your job. And you've been trying to take care of your mom because probably she's struggling a lot, right? Yeah, it's really hard because... Um, she's on disability and can't work. So her income is fixed and it's really low. And so, um, I mean, it doesn't help that she doesn't budget either, but when she gets to the end of the month, she never has any money. So she'll call me and be like, Hey, Kaylin, I'm at a gas station. I have no gas and I have no money. Will yeah. you send me some? Yeah. So what was your never again moment? Why, why, why now? Why are you calling? What happened? Um, cause last week, um, her water heater broke and everyone in my family was like texting me like, Hey, you know, your mom can't afford to fix that. And they're just expecting me to like give out this money to fix this water heater. Um, and luckily my grandparents paid for it and I didn't have to, but I just, I can't keep doing this. We're on like, um, myself and I just started, um, like this month, like really intensely working on um, baby step two. We're trying to pay off our debt. Um, and I just, I just can't keep doing this. So there's a great quote, um, and I'm going to butcher it a little bit, by um, a therapist that I hold in high regard. His name is Terrence Real, Terry Real. And the, the, the gist of the quote is, family dysfunction rolls downhill from generation to generation, like a forest fire through a family until one brave person has the courage to stop and turn and stare the forest fire down. And in doing so gives peace to ancestors they will never know. And that's what you're doing right now. And here's the, the, the part about that quote that doesn't get talked about is when you turn and face it, when you turn and face that dysfunction and you say no more, never again, you're going to get burned, right? You're going to get hurt. Your family members are going to say, I can't believe you're abandoning mom. You have all this money and you're not even. And it's going to hurt when they do that. And they don't get a vote. And when your mom chooses to not budget, to choose to not live in reality, that's hard. That's not your job to fix. 
Will there be a day that she might have to move in with you? Possibly. So you better get your house in order ASAP, right? Um, Yeah. It's not just magic. So you're doing the hard work. I I wish George and I could give you a magic pill that would say, just say these four sentences and this conversation is easy and it goes away. It's just, it's not how this works. You're going to get spit on. You're going to be told you're ungrateful. How dare you? I can't believe you. Um, And you're going to have to stand firm knowing the greatest thing long-term for your family is a safe, secure Kaylin whose house is in order. And that's just, that's just, it's hard. Yeah. Go ahead. The other layer to this is that um, my younger brother also lives there and he just turned 18 and he's developmentally disabled. Um, And so I feel like if I don't give my mom money, then like, I don't know if he's going to eat. Then if you're worried about him, then that's a conversation between you and your husband about whether he moves in with y'all or you go sit down with a, um, with some of the community resources in your, where you live and you look at long-term care housing options that are community funded. Um, but here's the thing, just throwing money at this problem when you know your mom is not um, responsible with that money, you don't know that he's going to eat even if you do give her money. Because if that was a question, if she was choosing to spend money on other stuff or him eat, she's going to she's gonna do that whether she's got money or not. That's like that's a, that's character stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's the nature of your mother's disability? Um, it's kind of twofold. So um, she has a seizure disorder, but also um, she can't really stand or walk very well. Um, my other brother was abusive for a long time and um, like beat her so badly that her knees are completely shot. Oh, good. It's awful. What a mess. But you said she's driving. Yeah. You said she's getting gas. Yeah, she can drive. Okay. I'm just trying to think if there's a way out of this long term versus, you know, I'm not mad at taking disability from the government, but if there's a way for her to make more income than that and have a better quality of life right. and to where you're not having to be the government for her, then I'd rather us aim for that and you help her get there. Or if you do yeah. give her money and you decide to, to work that into your budget, that you pay X bill and you pay that bill directly to the electrician or you, or the electric company or to the water company or wherever you happen to do that. But I'm not just going to keep putting money in a black hole um, or I'm going to take two or three years and really work hard and then mom's going to move in with us or wh- whatever that looks like. That's part of you owning reality there, but whew, it's a mess. There is no easy way out of this when you say no more. It's hard. Thanks for the call, Kalen. We're wishing you the best. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey folks, you know that sinking feeling when you make an offer on a house you love and then you hear there's another offer? You need the Churchill Mortgage Home Buyer Edge. Super fast pre-approval and a secured interest rate. Plus a $5,000 seller guarantee gives your offer the best chance of being accepted. The Home Buyer Edge from Churchill gives you an advantage over those other guys. Go to churchillmortgage.com today to learn more. by Dr. John Deloney. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Don't be scared. Give us a call. We'll talk through your biggest worries, concerns, questions. We'll celebrate (laughs) with you. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. They used to be like the no fear shirts when I was in high school. It's more for the younger generation. They're like, I didn't know my phone could make phone calls. 
I, oh, that like, is true. There's an anxiety about talking getting on the phone. Yeah. You know this. I do. So that's who I was talking to. Gotcha. The ones who are like, they get a phone call, they get spooked. It's like, S-K-E-E-E-R-D. One day, scared. the show will just be us texting back and forth with screen recording. <laughs> no, for, the, the bots will just do it for us. They don't need us. At that point, we'll be out of a job. Well, hey, our question of the day is brought to you by Neighborly, your hub for home services. Their nationwide network of locally owned home service pros like Molly Maid, Shelf Genie, and Mr. Appliance take the stress out of home repairs, maintenance, and improvements. Visit Neighborly.com to schedule a service today. Today's question comes from Dylan in Maryland. Dylan asks, why do you recommend... (laughs) I love that. You know who starts questions like that? My seven-year-old. But that's cool. Why do you recommend paying off my mortgage that has a low interest rate that provides a ta- tax deductions instead of keeping the money invested where I'm getting a higher return on that interest? This seems like an illogical financial approach. Oh, yeah, boy. George. Dylan should be hosting this show. This guy has cracked the code, man. I know. He's smarter. It's clearly smarter than you. He's a genius. Because yeah. you're illogical. I, I'm going to be honest. I'm exhausted by this question, John, because... We have had a historically low mortgage rates, so everyone got these crazy low mortgage rates of two and a half, three percent, three and a half percent, and then now interest rates on savings accounts are like four percent. So they're like, "I'm never paying off my mortgage." You're an idiot if you pay off your mortgage early, dude. This is a money making scheme. Go invest in the stock market instead of paying off your mortgage. And I'm going, where are they getting? guaranteed returns of 10% in the stock market. Now, we say long-term, the stock market has seen 10 to 12% on average. But assuming that in a given year, it's not going to be, I don't know, negative 18% like it was in 2021, that is a wild, starry-eyed approach to finances. And there's a whole other piece of this, which you can speak to, which is the freedom and peace of not having a house payment goes so much further than just a math equation on paper. Yeah, I call it um, my soul tax or a sleep tax. Um, I, I've heard it called several different things, but for three or four percentage points on an annual return to not have a house payment, nobody can take away my house. I can get fired tomorrow and it'd be annoying and not devastating. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to even put a price on that. And if you look at some of the data emerging about anxiety and your body's response to how much money you owe, you might think in your fancy pants prefrontal cortex that you uh, got a great deal. And quite honestly, you did. You got a good deal. You're making a good return against your 3% APR on your house. You're making 9%. You're making 6%. But your amygdala knows. The part of your brain that's designed to keep you safe knows at any moment we lose our home, right? And so even the idea, George, of debt on your house is so relatively new given our the human psychology right over the last thousands and thousands of millions of years. Just the idea that someone's saying, I just want to keep owing a bank my money on my house instead of it being mine and my in my children's and my children's children's is insane. I'll just put it that way. But yes, Dylan, let's call it out. You are right. You are right. You can have a 2.8% APR on your house and you can invest that money and right this moment in history you can you can you can cover the gap. You can cover that spread. But I promise you I sleep better than you do. That's all. That's fair. Well, there's another piece of this that he mentioned that really it my gears had hath been grinded. Well, and that's the tax illogical gears. This whole idea of tax deductions and we walk through this in Financial Peace <laughs> University. <laughs> but so I'm good. like how bad are you at math that you think Sending $10,000 to your mortgage lender in interest is better than sending $2,000 to the IRS. That's what you're doing. You're stepping over a dollar to pick up a quarter and thinking that you're winning. And the mortgage companies love this. They're like, great, send us more interest instead of the IRS. We're way better than the IRS. That's what you're doing. And by the way, almost nobody itemizes on their taxes anymore. Everyone takes the standard deduction, which means you don't get to deduct your mortgage interest. And so almost nobody's doing this. So this theoretical idea that you're doing it for the tax deductions is wildly illogical. And by the way, you can't compare your interest you're making in a savings account to your mortgage interest. It's different. It's weighed way in the favor of interest when you get that mortgage. Go look at your amortization schedule and you'll see you're going, I paid $600 in interest 
on my mortgage that has a 3% interest rate. My savings account only made $40 this month. <laughs> so you can't weigh the two against each other. Unless you have the full amount of your mortgage sitting in a savings account, then on paper, you might be able to say temporarily that you can beat it. You but know what? I, had, how, I hadn't life. thought of that, George. A fooey on me, man. But that's actually really wise. So if I owe $500,000 and I'm paying 2%, I and I'm getting five percent or six percent in a in a savings account on my ten thousand dollars. That's not apples to apples. No, because I'm paying all my interest up front on that mortgage. Exactly, it's front loaded in a, in a significant way. Well, there you go, being but logical. George. I don't. I they call me a dream crusher when I say these things, John. <laughs> I'm like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He, this here's, guy's here, here, here's here's like what when it comes down to it. The house you had, um, that you, the house you paid off, I'm assuming because of when you bought it, your interest rate was low. Yeah, I think it was three six two five. Okay, mine was two eight five. Mine was super super low. You're an idiot for paying it off, John. You could have made so much money. But I guess the the proof in the pudding is this isn't us just throwing mathematical theories up against the wall. This is how we just live our lives, right? Yes. And it's not a game, or it's not like yeah. yeah. No, it's, I, I, I'm. It, it, this is how we live. Well, and the other part we didn't mention was. You know what you can do when you don't have a mortgage payment? You could invest a mortgage payment All and start it. doing the math on what that turns into and the options it gives you and the options to do the things that people like Dylan want to do, which is retire early. I don't know. Maybe you want to give more. You have some outrageous giving goals, spending goals. You want to take the family on a cruise. It's just harder to do that when you've got a mortgage around your neck. That's right. And so like John said, I'm sleeping better. I'm living better. I'm investing better. And I'm okay with the, like, I could have made more if I, you will go crazy thinking about the what ifs and what if I invested in the market and what if I got in on Bitcoin 10 years ago and what if I got on an Uber, you can't live with the what ifs. I just go with what is the reality of my present. And the reality is I don't have a mortgage payment, so I'm going to sleep better. Or the reality is I have to give somebody money every month or they will take my house from me. And I don't want that in my life, right? It's mm -hmm. just as simple as I don't, I don't want to owe somebody for my home. And I, I really honestly don't care what that costs me. It's the people George were talking to during the last three years on the student loan interest pause that just saw a golden opportunity to pay all this stuff off with no interest. And then there's those, the vast majority of folks who- 99% to be exact. Went and uh, bought new cars and bought new mortgages because the rates were so low and they're going to find themselves in a mess here in a, in a couple of months. Yeah, interest is a maddening game. Mm -hmm. Whether it's 0% or 3% and you think you're winning because you can get a spread on the interest rate. But think about all the mental calories you're burning just trying to play a game created by lenders and by this broken, toxic financial system designed to keep you broke. Mm -hmm. They love that you are losing sleep thinking about the spread on interest rates. Mm -hmm. All the while, the folks who are debt-free are going, oh, I haven't thought about debt in years. We've just been over here living our life. And so it's a different game. Yeah. It's chess and checkers, and we're out here trying to teach you all how to play some chess. I do like checkers, Checkmate. Though. I'm not smart enough to play yeah, chess. Yeah, that's true. I haven't played chess. And you're illogical. No, I'm not that good. I've seen the Netflix show, though. That was an interesting one. Oh, The Gambit? Yeah. I didn't watch it. Yeah. It's all right. We'll get you there, That's John. too busy getting smarter. Too busy paying off a mortgage and stuff. Well, hey, it's a fun question. It's a fun conversation. I hope we answered it, Dylan. I don't know that you're pleased, but people like Dylan, they're hard to please, John. Very hard to please. More of your questions coming up. 888 5225 This is The Ramsey Show. Guys, being free to make your own medical decisions is a big deal these days. Christian Healthcare Ministries gives members the freedom to choose the doctors and providers they want without the frustration of worrying about networks and with no waiting period to join. It's a membership-based nonprofit ministry where hundreds of thousands of Christians share funds to pay for and pray for each other's medical bills. For over 40 years, CHM has helped families living across all 50 states. 
so see if CHM could be right for your family. Check out more today at chministries.org slash budget. I'm George Campbell, joined by Dr. John Deloney. This is The Ramsey Show. We're talking about your life, your money, relationships, the stuff that matters to you. And we want to hear from you. That's the show. It's you. If it's just us us two hanging out here, it's a terrible show. We need you guys to make it great. We don't even like hanging out with each other. No, terrible. But uh, if you want to join the conversation, you can call the number 888-825-5225. Hayden has chosen to do that, has been... Uh, selected to make it through. <laughs> so like he has chosen. The contestant. Like he's heading into the Matrix or something, you weirdo. Hayden, Gosh. welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Also, I want to thank you for you know being part of my inspiration over the past couple of months. And me and my daughter listen to you guys in the podcast every morning on our run. So appreciate oh, you. Oh, that's incredible. Very we, cool, we're man. appreciative of that. How can we help today? Absolutely. Okay. So I want you guys to input on this. So just a little insight. 22 years old married with a nine month old. I'm in school right now. I have two jobs, one of which is a business that me and my wife run. I'm looking to get a third job because we're looking to pay off some debts. I did fall into the trap a few months back where I thought I had to, you know, um, we get, get in debt to, or have money to make more money. And then I, my parents are Ramsey people. And so they reintroduced me. And so now I'm back on track. So Question Good. today for you guys is I have two options for a third job that I'm looking for. First of which is basically like an additional full-time job that would require me to work Sunday through Thursdays from 7 or 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. And then I'd be jumping into my full-time job from 8 a.m. and then finish up around like 4 or 5. And that would bring in another $4,000 a month for us. Or my second option would be picking up like a – like part-time real retail job. And it'd probably take us like twice as long to pay off the money, but it'd be half the work. So that's just kind of my dilemma. I'm in like the super gazelle intense mode right now. The first option as well would require me to put off school for one semester to finish it. What are you studying? Business. How close are you to being done? So I just got my associates and I'm doing school more part-time than full-time and cash flow in it all. How much debt do you owe? So it's 27500 What are you hoping to do with the business degree? Um, I'm very entrepreneur-minded, um, but also I, I enjoy the job I'm at now and open to like another job and just kind of have a business on the side to fulfill that entrepreneur dream. What's the business you and your wife are running? Yeah, so we do Turo, where we own a few cars, and then we manage other people's cars as well. Oh, and you went into debt for these cars. It, yeah, correct. How much and money are you making? We were like, so on the best month we've done, we did 6000 in profit, and then last month was the worst, and we broke even after paying off. Um, so like zero dollars? And everything. What if I told you yeah, to go sell correct. those two cars? Um, I would be open to it. I've thought about it. Um, you know, we, we definitely could get out that way. Um, only like only reason why I, I, I keep thinking about just paying them off is because I do like having that extra income and knowing that like we could pay it off. Um, Bro, it was zero dollars like, last pay- month. Yeah, I know. It's because like Arizona, no one wants to come here. Okay. During the summer times. Hey, now I want so, you to win. And calling right. this a business yeah. is frivolous. That would be like me saying, right. "Hey, I own a business. What do you do? I drive for Uber." Right. And Correct. so I understand that, like, for Turo, sure. people can do this, and you saw some TikToks, and this guy was like, dude, just get, go into debt for, like, 17 cars, and then you flip those, and you get the money from Turo, and the cars are depreciating right. assets, which makes this a, not a great business model. For sure. So if you sold these cars, would you get out of debt completely? I would, yep, and I would still have a couple of cars that we bought with And that. then, here's what would happen. You can actually sleep, because the plan you just laid out for us means you will might be able to eat a meal and you might be able to get two hours of sleep. Right. 
with a nine month old and depreciating right. assets that you're trying to pay off. Like it, it, it doesn't make sense as a dad. Does it make sense as a new husband? Does it make sense as a 23 year old guy? I'm all for you finishing that degree. You're, that's going to be a good uh, uh, tool in your in your tool in your toolkit, bro. Sell the cars, man. And listen, okay. if if you after 30 to 60 days of not owing anybody any money as a brand new dad, and you and your wife mm-hmm. have no fights about money, and um, you just miss the excitement, then go take out loans and go buy two more cars. Yeah. I'm almost 100% positive that's not going to happen. The plan you laid out with working 22 hours a day, that's, that's, that's not viable, man. Yeah. That's not viable. You're right. I get it, but it's not viable. I'd much rather see you right. work full time, get done with school, and be 25 years old with a your business degree. You've got several years of working full time, and you're ready to go take on the world at that point. Yeah, I see that. And for whatever okay. it's worth, I didn't get my first full time job in in higher ed as at a university until I was at the end of being 20. Uh, no, it was, it, was, it, was, it was when I was 26. And so wow. you haven't even started yet, bro. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know. I, I'm I'm a very impatient person. I got that. I got I've that. That I've been working on. Yeah. Yeah, but that impatience you learned at a young at a young age, but that impatience got you two cars that are depreciating assets that you're trying to work 22 hours a week to pay off. So it doesn't if to, to get a job that some months breaks even because it's too hot where you live. Yeah. So I just wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, you laid it out in front of us, and we do what we tell you we would do, and that is a scary situation. I'm getting out of this thing, and I'm going to start a real business down the line when I'm ready. But for now, sell the cars. Dude, the Turo people are coming after you, man. I mean, I like Turo. I think it's a really cool idea. What is it? It's where I can rent John Deloney's car and drive it around for a rental fee. So huh. you can list your car like an Airbnb, list your house for rent just like your, with your car. So it seems like... The people who have a vested interest in that gig is the car dealerships whose business is getting taken out from under them by online sales, that they have these fleet of cars out in their lots that they can just rent out on the weekends. Yeah, I mean, it's competing with the car rental companies. It's kind of taken it into our own hands, which on some levels is great because you can rent with a debit card with no issues. Hmm. And it's really slick, and I can just go on the app and choose a car in, in my area and do it without even seeing a person. And they can remotely unlock it. There's all kinds of things they can do. So it's a pretty cool feature, but I'm not going to make that a business model. And I've seen some of these guys on Instagram where they go, I got a fleet of seven cars and this is my business. And that's fine. That can be a legitimate business. But doing it with debt just adds way too much risk. We have different Instagram feeds, just FYI. I don't know what has happened, John. The algorithm is like, we will punish this man. (laughs) Give him everything that would just make him upset. We have very different Instagrams. What's on your Instagram? Um, just workout videos, mostly workout videos and architecture and a couple of guys in the Everglades catching snakes. That's about it. I take it back. That also is my nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what my ideal Instagram algorithm is, but it's not dudes catching snakes and it's not protein powders. Well, it's <laughs> yours is like, all right, bro, money making hack 4,007. You're right. Let's do it. In hindsight, yours sounds a way better, <laughs> but I cannot tell you, John, you probably get this too. So many people send us videos in the DMs going, have you guys seen this? What do you think about this? What would Ramsey say? And half the time, it's just a person who's real excitedly telling you how to make a lot of money fast. Yeah, and the except faster, they're wrong. Yeah, and the more excited they are and the faster they say I'm going to make it, the less I trust them and the quicker you should just run away in the other direction. Right. Because usually they have some scammy get-rich-quick course to sell you. They're a life insurance salesman half the time telling you why 401ks are stupid and why their insurance plan is going to beat the stock market somehow. That's most of the videos I get. And you or probably it's, get it's a much different ones. 25 year old kid calling you illogical because they, f- they figured out the, the hack. They solved the issue. They solved it. We figured it out, man. Jeez. We're just going to do, we're going to write off the taxes and become millionaires. We s- <laughs> just start the LLC. We're going to become millionaires with our tax write offs. We're going to solve aging. We're figuring it all out, open George. Open a million dollars in a line of credit, invest that money, open an LLC, write off the Range Rover as part of that. Boom. You're a bajillionaire. That's social media advice. And with what the, we're with telling a Range you do, Rover. And we're the dream crushers telling you, nah, maybe just stay out of debt. I don't know, invest for the future and live a peaceful life. Near, near. Not as exciting. Not very sexy. Gosh, we're terrible. No one's ever media. called us sexy, George. Ah. Ever.
That's fair. All right. More of The Ramsey Show coming right up. 888 825 to the Ramsey Show. I'm George Campbell, joined by Dr. John Deloney. Hey, if you're a new listener to the show, we are so grateful that you're here. We're glad you found us, however you found us. And if you want a deeper dive on this stuff, there's a lot of insider talk, a lot of lingo, a lot of baby steps. We want to help you take the right next step at RamseySolutions.com. Click on the Get Started button, and we would be happy to help you figure that out. RamseySolutions.com. Click on Get Started. Lakeisha joins us in Cleveland up next. Lakeisha, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, So the reason I'm calling today is because I'm engaged to be married in February of next year. And me and my fiance are going back and forth of whether or not to pause the baby steps to cash flow the wedding or do both at the same time. Okay. So the wedding's in February. How much debt do you have? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> about, <laughs> that was incredible. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, about Between both of us, it's about 200000 What kind of debt is that? Um, student loans, mostly. Are, uh, you a, are you a doctor? No. He, his is more than mine. Um, he is a social worker. And I'm a mail carrier, so I'm not even using mine. What's his degree in? Social work. In social work? Yeah. George is not in honors classes. I'm just... (laughs) (laughs) To be a social worker, yeah. Yeah. So is is he an LMSW? Um, Yes. Okay, so that's that's graduate school too. Yes. Yes, he has about 150,000. Oh my gosh. What is your income? (sighs) Um, I make about seventy eight. Good thousand. Okay, and what's he, and he make? makes about? Oh, he makes about seventy off though. Okay, so once you're married, you'll combine bank accounts, and that will be y'all's income. But for now, we've got to focus on your debt. He's got to focus on his debt, and at the same time, we need to make a plan for how we're paying for this wedding. Now, yeah. there's a few options here. Number one is you go to the courthouse and you get this thing done and we have a big celebration after the debt's paid off and we can pay for a party for everyone. That's option number one. You don't like that? Lakeisha's not having it. Hates that one. No. Go to plan two, George. Plan two is we have a very reasonable wedding and we pay cash for it. I don't like the idea of pausing the debt payoff process in order to just save up and pay for an extravagant party for other people. So what is this wedding going to cost? Um, about 18000 18000 And how much cash do you guys have between the two of you? Um, not much right now. So probably Early, just I a mean, few thousand, if that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lakeisha, can I, can I be super direct with you? Because I feel like we're best friends now. Of course, of course. I hate to say what I'm about to say. Y'all are broke. And y'all are scary broke. You're marrying somebody who is committed to serving his community. He has a graduate degree. He's, I'm confident that he's very, very smart. They don't just hand out LMSWs. And you are adding significant value to your community. Your community only works because someone like you is, is in it and, and committed to it. But y'all are scary, scary broke. And I don't mean to say that to be like... Uh, like, I don't know, to try to start fires where there's no need to, but you guys have to get it through your heads that y'all owe 200000 dollars. That's a house. And it's not a house, right? And so I understand the dream of the wedding, and you've had this dream since you were little. You have this picture in your head of what this is going to look like, and I think you can still make it happen. And 
right now, y'all don't have anything, man. Y'all got to pay this thing off. Yes, I, I, I know. I, <laughs> so here's the problem. If we said, hey, don't get married until the debt's paid off, well, that could be three, four years from now, right? So yeah. I don't like that plan. Right. If you guys are ready emotionally, spiritually, mentally to be together, to be married, we want you to do that as soon as you can. And it doesn't have to involve a giant party that you throw for other people. Because truthfully, that's what it is. Yes, they're celebrating you, but that 100 bucks a person is what you're paying for. You're paying for their meal, for their stuff, and hopefully they give you a nice gift. But at this point, 200 grand in the hole, it's only going to set you back further to spend another 200 grand, 20 grand to go into debt for this wedding because you don't have the money. Right. I mean, right now, are you guys able to pay bills, let alone set aside money for this wedding? Um, it's been a struggle. I mean, we both picked up side jobs, so we're both pretty much working seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we're trying, but I mean, like I said, it's been really more focused on trying to get money because we've put deposits down on stuff as well. So that's not my other issue. How far, how far down the rabbit hole are you? How much, how much money are you in already? Um, about 2000. Okay. So it's not a lot, but we like sign contracts with people. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty serious. Yeah, I would. I here's yeah. what I would do. I want you, and this is going to sound ridiculous. I want you to actually grieve this wedding that you wanted to have. <laughs> and it sounds silly, like oh my gosh, there's so many people in the world with bigger problems. You're right, but this is still heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Because you had this picture that was going to happen, and you went to college, and your husband went to grad school, and both of y'all are service-oriented people. Y'all deserve this, right? And you've also put yourself in a little bit of a hole because you put $2,000 in deposits down to, to various vendors. And so I want you to have some sort of moment, some sort of miniature ceremony for what was. This is what it was going to be. And then I want you to look at the deposits you've put down and how small yet beautiful yet honorable wedding you can have with the deposits you've put down and get out of this thing and throw a big blowout, the blowout of the century when you two are able to breathe and stand up on your own two feet because you owe nobody anything. That to me is, is, is also worthy of celebration. It's an independence day, right? It's freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the other piece, Lakeisha. The sooner you guys get married, the sooner you can combine bank accounts and combine incomes, the sooner you can pay off this debt. There is magic when you have dual incomes attacking the debt together. It's just a game changer. So I don't want you just delaying this to pay off the debt. I don't want you throwing a huge wedding now while you're in the debt. Both of those aren't good options. So I think we need to find some middle ground here where we go. We're going to do a real small backyard ceremony. We're going to do the courthouse thing. We'll throw a huge party later. But right now we got to focus on cl just climbing out of this hole that we've been. And your friends are going to give it to you, your family. Are you kidding me? You're not going to. Yep. You guys make too much money to be doing this. We are changing our family tree. And hey, uh, wedding gift for you. Um, we're going to send you. Financial Peace University and one year of the Every Dollar app so that when y'all get married, y'all can combine this thing. It'll help you work together. It, it combines with your bank. It puts everybody on the same page. And it's a tool that y'all can use. I want y'all to watch those videos together, go through that stuff together, and it will help you either get on the same page or it will clarify some hard conversations y'all need to have as y'all head into this into this, meeting, this to this marriage either way. But yeah, phew, George, that's tough, man. I wish I had good answers for you, Lakeisha, that just made you smile. But this is one of those tough situations where I can't in good faith go to bed tonight knowing I told Lakeisha, have the wedding of your dreams. Mm. If this was any other purchase, we would say, you're broke. You can't afford that vacation. You can't afford that car. And a wedding is no different. While it's special and it's spiritual, the idea that we have to always spend 20, 30, 40, 50, I had one call, $500,000 on a wedding is just insane. <laughs> And I also want to call out, because of the choices we're making on a daily basis, some of these things, what I would call core cultural values, um, buying a home, um, having a, an extravagant celebration of two families coming together and two people heading off to create a new 
adventure together. We're having to pause or minimize or crush those because of the daily decisions we're making about buying stupid cars, by going $200,000 into student loan debt. So we've got to have a cultural conversation about, hey, we are cashing out on these institutions that matter just so we can eat on Friday. We gotta change the way we live, George. Yeah, man. These weddings are too important. They're too beautiful. They're too important. That puts this hour of The Ramsey Show in the books. I'm George Camel. He's John Deloney. We'll be back before you know it. Hey, it's Dr. John Deloney. If you love the show and want a deeper dive on your money journey, we have a weekly newsletter that gives you trending and helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for our newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods moving and storage studio, it's The Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create amazing relationships. I'm George Camel, joined by Dr. John Deloney, and we are excited and enthused to take your calls at 888-825-5225. If you need some confirmation, affirmation, inspiration, Whatever you're going through, whatever's keeping you up at night, we want to help you take the right next step. Some constipation. We some... can't give you that. Oh, I don't know that we can relieve that I either. I am certain we can give you constipation. <laughs> John has been known to do that, and he's very, very good at it. He's uh, He's got a PhD. I don't know what it's in, but apparently he's got one in or two. <laughs> in, in, it's in... My PhD is in the inability to go to the bathroom. There are dumber degrees out there, so it would not shock me at this point. That's probably fair. But we'll get there. Regardless of how many degrees John has, we can help, hopefully. What, what are all those Asians you dropped out? Inspiration, affirmation, confirmation. Constipation. Motivation. That's not in there. You keep throwing that one in there. All right. Stop trying to make it happen. All right. All right. Jeremy is up first, if he still even wants to talk to us. Jeremy, how you doing? Hey, guys. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. What's going on? Uh, well, I've reached a point of desperation in my life. I listen to you guys uh, every night, but I still can't get my act together. Um, I have six kids, uh, and me and my wife, we maybe bring in about 65000 a year. We have no savings, no emergency fund, and we're barely able to pay our bills as they are mm. uh, due, due to, like, a special circumstance where – I'm kind of getting double dip for child support where I'm paying for two kids who live with me. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm, I have two $600 car payments as well as the student loans are getting ready to drop. We have about 50,000, 40,000 actually in student loans between me and my wife. What do you do for a living, man? I'm a bus driver for Disney. What do you make a year doing that? So I make about 55000 a year, uh, and that's with my overtime. And is your wife working outside the home? Where's the other ten k coming from? Um, well, my wife works over at Walmart. She's a regular associate. Okay, and that's part-time? Yes. Okay. Do you have a degree with these student loans you got to pay back? Uh, I have a certificate from Universal Technical Institute. And she has some schooling from Puerto Rico. Okay. Well, there's two pieces to the puzzle. There's decreasing expenses, which you've got six kids. You've got a lot going on, on top of the debt payments, on top of normal bills that people have. And then we've got to also increase the income. We've got to find ways to make more because we've, we're in the situation where we have a lot of mouths to feed and a lot of debt to pay. And do, do you hear George? I want you to – George just distilled that down. But it's as simple as is that. And I know it's terrifying to think that it's that simple. But the only two options here are to increase what you make and decrease the expenses you have. So everything. So the only issue with that is we've been looking uh, and like. But you haven't because you got two $600 a month car payments. I would That's look we have right in the driveway credit. and I would go, those things got to go today. Yeah. What are the cars worth? 
Um, my van's worth about 11000 and we owe fourteen. And my Corolla is worth about fifteen, and we owe, I believe, thirteen. But uh, we needed the Corolla because I live about 55 miles from my job. I, so I it, needed the, the gas mileage. Why is this the end-all, be-all job? Uh, it's been they've been very good to me. It's I mean it has you great can't, benefits. It's, you it's, can't afford to live there, brother. I mean you can't afford to work there. It's fifty miles away for fifty thousand dollars. You can go be an assistant manager at a fast food restaurant and make that money. What is it about that job? Because that job is costing you two hours of commute time a day. It's costing you a car you cannot afford, and it's not paying you enough to pay your bills. Yeah, I don't have I don't have a real good answer for that. I mean, I, I, I know I really hard, enjoy my listen, job. I enjoy the guest interaction. Oh, dude, uh, I, dude, I know I'm I'm stomping on your heart. I know you love that job. You love the people. And my understanding is, when you are fully bought in as a Disney employee, it's it is it's a family big time. Like it, it it's a community. I get that. And you are broke, and you can't breathe. And then you get in a car that's depreciating every second you sit in it and drive an hour in that traffic to work a job that does not pay you enough to support all six kids. What's your total consumer debt, Jeremy? Uh, About 90000 Is your wife able to work more? What is the child care situation like? I I can't even imagine taking care of six kids. I imagine the ages are wildly spread. George has two... Were they pugs? Yeah, French, French bulldogs. French my bulldogs. Is, <laughs> he has, he has two French 15. bulldogs. Yeah. Okay, fifteen. I have it, and my youngest two are two and one. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where that comes, where she has to help uh, with the babies, okay. and while, especially like while I'm while I'm working, and I mean it does. You asked one of the benefits. One of the benefits is that I do get to take my kids to to Disney on my days off. So I mean that's kind of a a, a hey, big brother, benefit for my children. For the next couple of years, you don't get days off. You owe ninety thousand dollars. Ninety thousand dollars. You've got to start making some headway on this. And I, dude, trust me, I'm not trying to be a jerk, man. I'm just trying to put both hands on your shoulders and let you realize how precarious your situation is. And if the cars can get us out of what they can decrease our debt by $27,000. Obviously, we've got to save up some money. We've got to figure out the underwater situation. We've got to get keep some the, Keep cars. the van, right? Keep the van because you've got 14,000 children, right? So keep the van. And then I, here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to rattle your cage a little bit to get you out of the, there's just no way. There is ways, but you got to be willing to go all in, man. Yeah. And if you called in, you said, hey, I make 100. I got 50 to pay off. We'd go, all right, let's make a plan. But you're making 65 and owe 90. And so the math is skewed in a tough way where the only way out of this is to go make a whole bunch more money and do it quickly. And legally. And that means you're going to have to work several jobs that are not your dream job, do not fulfill your soul, that you're not going to write home and tell mom about, but that put money in your account. Yeah, I've tried to look for like side hustles or like different opportunities. Uh, Uber is just not a good one because it, it just appreciates the value of the, the asset. And Uber also, I mean, you could Uber to work and home from work. That is a thing you could do. Uh, stay on the line, brother. We're going to give you FPU. I'm going to send it to you, man. And Financial Peace University and the Every Dollar app. I want you and your wife to watch those videos, man. Y'all have to get radical because you are so close to the edge. And George and I spend our careers watching people fall over the edge. And I don't want that to be you. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. 
but something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything, from design consultation to measuring and installation. Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Go to Blinds.com now and save 45% off selected products. Visit Blinds.com today for more info. This is The Ramsey Show. Thank you for joining us. I'm George Campbell, joined by Dr. John Deloney. If you like this show, we have lots more where that came from. In fact, my friend Dr. John does his own show called The Dr. John Deloney Show right next door in the studio uh, over from us. And it's a wonderful, wonderful show. Deeper dives, deeper calls, deeper everything. Just a very deep show, but also so fun. John brings a lot of levity to it. I don't know anyone's ever called it just a wonderful show. Just a wonderful show. That's how, that's how my grandmother used to describe my haircuts. Like, well, just sometimes wonderful. I'll walk by the studio while you're doing it live and I go, oh gosh, that's a doozy. Yeah, they're heavy. It's, it's a heavy show. It's a lot of fun though. But you handle it, uh, and you take it all in stride and you help a lot of people and it's... I mean, it's just exploded in popularity. So oh, I appreciate that. I'm now trying to compete. I've got my own YouTube channel that is a lot oh, less. Dude, you are flying it's by less me, man. salacious, but uh, we focus on making money fun again. I sang a cover of Creed to open a video about adjustable rate mortgages, if that tells you anything. Oh, I thought and it James was going to be about washed up. Producer James played guitar in the background. And we had a good time with that. Uh, that's so embarrassing you can go for everybody. Check out that video on adjustable rate mortgages, because that's what you want to do on a Thursday. <laughs> Here we go. I thought it was going to be something on guilty pleasures. Hey, um, so I get this question sometimes like, uh, Hey, we, we, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> right. People ask me like, why do you, why do you work here? Why did Dave Ramsey hire you? Yes. Um, and Dave behind closed doors, the joke is always, um, I've been telling people for years that money is 80% psychology and 20% like knowledge. Right. And he's also been telling people for years, you need to go see somebody. You can go talk to somebody, and he finally just said, I'm just going to hire my own, right? There is a, some significant overlap when it comes to finances and your mental health, and we know that. I'm actually working with a student, um, a doctoral student, uh, at, with some dissertation research on this, and it, I can't tell you how much joy it brings me to see these articles being written here, the article I'm holding right now, um, because it's bringing this to light, and we don't talk about it enough in our culture. If we look at anxiety, we look at depression, we look at these things that have a trend line almost – completely vertical. They're going straight up and they have been. If you lay a map uh, or a, 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 a graph on top of that that plots the amount of money individuals and we collectively owe in this country, it almost perfectly mimics it. Wow. I'm not saying it's causal, but there is correlation between debt and your mental health. So the article here um, says, comes as no surprise that debt affects your mental health. New research shows that being in debt not only increases anxiety, it also impacts your retirement plans and marital status too. We know those things, but people who have debt report an increase in stress, anxiety, and moodiness. The National Deep Debt Relief noted that this can lead to divorce or even putting off marriage. Three in five Americans have considered putting off marriage to avoid inheriting their partner's debt. We talked about marriage yeah. and debt a, a, a segment ago. And 54% believe having a partner who's in debt is a major reason to consider divorce found that people lose over 200 hours of sleep per year on average over their debts. Now, I just wanted to put that into um, more stark terms. 
The great Dr. Matthew Walker has done some extraordinary work. And if you haven't checked out his podcast or his book, Why We Sleep, you should. He's just a master class and he's just so brilliant and he speaks language that I can even understand. Talks about the catastrophic consequences of a culture that stops sleeping. That goes simply from six hours, uh, from seven hours a night to six hours, from eight hours to six and a half hours. It costs you everything. It costs you your mental health. It costs you long-term health, short-term health. It disrupts everything. And so when people say, yeah, I've got this debt over here, but I'm going to invest in the market. Or I, I just have 50000 Yeah. I, I just have my student loans. I say something like, I have a sleep tax. That's the price I'm paying so that I don't die with mm -hmm. some of these ailments. Losing sleep is killing us, man. And this, this surveys are showing the, the more debt you have, the more sleep you lose. It says people are, aren't sleeping. They're having nightmares. We're losing about a month of sleep per year. Wow. And That's they're even insane. talking about debt nightmares. Yeah. Nightmares related to the debt that you owe. And this right. is even, I mean, 7 in 10 said it feels like a black cloud hangs over them when they have to pay a bill or a loan. 77% reported debt would impact their retirement plans. They said they're missing out on more activities, turning down a night out with friends. They're turning down date nights. They're turning down attending weddings and uh, credit card it, it, like, debt. Let's just, that's life. That's life. Hanging out with your friends, celebrating weddings, going to weddings where you don't even know anybody and you can dance even crazier than you usually do, right? Um, going out on dates, even ones that are awkward and weird. This is life. We are cashing out our life mm. for this debt. It's killing people, man. It's not worth it's it. It's killing them. It's killing them. It's killing them. Oh, man, this is brutal. And John, you've been talking about this at our Building Wealth events that we were doing. And every time you say it, the crowd just, they're like, yes. And you, here's what you say. Debt has a physical weight on us. And that's scientific. And you say, hey, how many of you, you've become debt free? And you know exactly what I'm talking about when that weight gets lifted. And they're all like, yes, I remember that feeling. And people don't realize, it's like wearing an ankle bracelet holding you down. You don't realize it until they're off. Right. How I, much weight I it actually I remember um, talking to Dave. This is, I've been, I'd been coasting the show with him for about six months or so. And I told him, um, I, I don't, didn't get nervous anymore, right? My heart rate doesn't get up. I'm not nervous. Like, oh gosh, there's millions. It's just, it's just the job now. And I was going through some of the data on my smartwatch. I was like, why is my heart rate spiking and holding for like, I wasn't exercising. I wasn't working. Oh, it reminded me of the great book title by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score. I might not be feeling anxious. My body knows I'm talking to millions of people. And if I say one thing wrong, the whole company goes away. Like It knows. It knows. And so you can say, oh, no, I got a great deal, man. I, don't, I got no APO. I got no interest for five years. It's a good deal. Your body knows. Dude, if he says one thing wrong at work, they're going to take away the car. They're going to take away his job. They're going to take away his marriage. This is not safe, right? Your body knows. And there's that feeling. Everybody who gets on that debt-free stage says, when you ask them, how does it feel? Their whole, you can go back and just watch. Their whole their body changes. Their physiology changes completely. They exhale. They drop their shoulders. It's freedom from a, a, a cage you didn't even know you were locked in. Right. So debt does affect your mental health. I would go as far to say, and I don't have the, the Huberman esque, uh, Huberman -esque uh, you know, neuro studies to back me up, but I don't believe a person can be fully unanxious, can have a life that is not stressed, chronically stressed, unless you don't owe anybody anything. There's some peace there where your body goes, we are safe now. <sighs> That car is ours. That house is ours. That land is ours. And we get to decide what we do tomorrow, not the bank. And anything other than that has some sort of physiological consequence to it, man. Yeah. I just believe that. Well, Dave's been saying for years that we want you we want you to have nice stuff. We don't want nice stuff to have you. Right. And now there's actually research to back up what he was saying. And it's not just the payment holding you back financially. It's the payment affecting your mental health. Your it affects your health. heart rate. It affects the ability for you to sleep. It affects your conversations with your spouse. It affects you will, being willing to go in there and dig a little deeper to save that marriage. Or, dude, I'm just going to bail. Right? Mm. It just It's a black cloud. I love the way they say that. It's well, just a storm cloud. There's clear research that that lack of sleep will shorten your lifespan. 
Oh, dude. The data is too clear on yeah. that. And so for that reason alone, get out of debt. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what more data we need to give you to say, here's a good reason to get out of debt. Don't die. Not because Dave Ramsey said so, because I want you to live to meet your grandkids. Right. I think that's a noble goal to have. And so do whatever it takes. This article, of course, has a terrible solution. Consider debt relief options. Yeah, the survey was put out by National Debt Relief. <laughs> you think they didn't pay for this? Uh, so here's a better option. You pay off your debt. You are the secret sauce. We believe, this crazy belief, that you can pay the debt that you got yourself into. You're the problem. You're the solution. And that is so freeing when you let it not control you and not put the shame and guilt and all that. Let it go and say, the guy in the mirror is the solution to my problems. I don't have to wait on a politician. I don't have to wait on a debt relief company. I can do this. So go through Financial Peace University. Use the Every Dollar app. Connect with other people on the journey. Do whatever it takes because debt freedom's on the other side and you will sleep better and you will live longer and uh, I think that's a life well spent, John. Hey, I love making up science on the air. I love it. It's what we do. It's what we do. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, Dr. John Deloney here. I'm a huge fan of both meditation and prayer. And good mental health includes slowing down, gaining control of your thoughts, and plugging into something bigger than you. And Hallow makes it easy to start a daily practice of meditation, prayer, and finding peace. Hallow is the number one Bible app in the world, and you can tailor content towards your faith tradition. From scripture readings and prayers to meditation and journaling, Hallow makes it easy to practice prayer, meditate, and build a deeper, more meaningful spiritual life and rediscover true peace. Go to hallow.com slash Ramsey today to get three months of Hallow for free. That's hallow.com slash Ramsey. George Camel, joined by Dr. John Deloney. This is The Ramsey Show. The number to call is 888-825-5225. Clinton joins us up next in Springfield. Clinton, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi, thanks for taking my call. Sure. How can we help? Okay. Uh, I have a little bit of analysis paralysis, and I was wondering if you guys could get some input on it. Um, so I have about $30,000 combined in consumer debt. It's an auto loan and a student loan. Um, my employer offers $200 a month towards my student loans as long as I maintain the minimum payment. And I was wondering if I should do a minimum payment on my student loans, which is a higher balance, uh, and then pay off my car loan first, or if I should just stay with the baby steps and pay off the smaller incremental loans uh, from the student loans first. So what is the car loan balance? About 12000 Okay, and then what is your smallest student loan balance? Uh, the smallest one's like a hundred bucks, but the normal ones are like two thousand. Okay, so what what's wrong with following the debt snowball method and just paying them off smallest to largest? Would that affect this? I, no, I just think that two hundred dollar incentive was giving me wiggle room for some reason, and I was just kind of curious what That's, you guys thought so about that. So you would that, lose the two hundred dollars a month? As long as I make minimum payments on the student loans, we keep the two hundred a month. But if you make more than that, then you lose it. Nope, they, they keep doing it as well. Oh, so I don't see the issue then. Am I not tracking, John? Yeah, I, I don't really understand what you're saying. So like if they you, can't, he can't, you have to like turn over your bank statement every month? No, I just have to make the payments and like, they, as long as they see I'm making the payments, they'll pay me the $200 towards my account. How do they know? How does your boss know what you're paying in your personal banking? Uh, I haven't done, so it doesn't start until payments resume. Um, from what I remember, they just have to, you can like hook them up with your, uh, uh, student loan servicer. Yeah. I would, I would never let my boss have access to my private banking's information or my bills ever. 
I wouldn't take the $200 on that principal alone. That's pure principal, and that's just me. That's not speaking for Ramsey. That's just me. Now, if you can but submit you know, a PDF verifying the there amount, that's fine. Definitely do that. But I'm still confused. Okay. If you just do the debt snowball, you attack the smallest student loan first. You're going to knock it out quick. They're going to give you an extra 200 bucks to do that. What's the problem just following this through? It looks like they would just only amp up your payoff process. Yeah, you're right. And like I said, I was just kind of getting hung up on the question. And I just wanted some more input, really. I would just, it's basically just gravy. It's icing on the cake to get the extra 200 bucks from your employer. But I'm living my life and following the debt snowball. And uh, you're going to attack this fast if you do that. Because you got 30 k total. What's the car worth? Uh, about 18. Okay. And what's your income? Uh, about 59. Okay, cool. Are you single, married? Uh, I, we got engaged on the 2nd. So oh, nice. Congratulations. That is awesome. Yeah, so that, I mean, that solves that in my book, and that hopefully solves your analysis paralysis. I'm just following the debt snowball. And break the student loans out. Don't look at it as one big balance. Break them out because they're probably a bunch of separate little debts, and just start attacking them with a vengeance. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. You got it. Appreciate the call, Clinton. Madeline is up next in Baltimore. Madeline, welcome to the show. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. What's going on? Thank you for taking my call. Um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. It's um, just Dr. I John. Started... <laughs> Thank you. Um, I started listening um, in 2017. I was fresh out of college. I had $30,000 in student loans and a $5,000 personal loan. And I started dating this guy who's now my husband, and he encouraged me to listen to the Ramsey show, and I was able to pay off my loans in three years as a teacher. Awesome. Um, huge blessing, yeah. So and you married well. I, I did, yeah. So now we're in a great situation. Um, we're debt-free. Um, we got married last year. Um, this kind of starts my context for my question. So uh, when we decided to get married, my parents um, – kind of offered to pay for our wedding. Uh, my parents have a high income, um, but my husband encouraged me to think a little bit more about it because my dad had paid for the majority of my private college, and it comes up a lot um, in a negative way. He kind of will say, um, he'll he'll bring up a lot that he did that. And so he said he didn't want that hanging over our heads with our wedding, and so we decided to pay for the whole wedding. By ourselves and we did it without that and we were able to purchase a home now a year later with 20 percent down wow um, way to so go your husband's really amazing great. your husband's incredible yeah. good for a lot of wisdom yeah and, it, yeah and it's all my husband i'm really thankful for him um so we're in a really great situation relationally and financially um, but like I alluded, my family has some just kind of like emotional problems, like my parents and my siblings. Um, my dad has been addicted to alcohol since the beginning of the pandemic, and it, it's the worst. It, it just gets worse and worse, and he's pretty unrecognizable. Um, and then actually in December, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Oh. Um and so my family is in a really bad position, um, somewhat financially, but a lot just relationally. And my husband and I, he's been really supportive, but we're trying to figure out, and this kind of brings me to my question, I would just love y'all's thoughts on just like biblically and, and faith-wise, um, what our responsibility is to our parents and families. Because um, I want to be a good daughter, um, but it just gets messy when they're not living on the same values that we are. Yeah, that's tough. Um, George, I'll, I'll throw my two cents in there and you throw yours in there. Um, so here's here's kind of my, my, my thoughts. And again, uh, when you, you're talking about obligations and spirituality and religion it 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 just is a firestorm right Uh, of you're right you're wrong all that kind of stuff right so this is just this is just me as for me in my house okay um Mm -hmm. i do believe that i've got a responsibility to honor my father and mother i do believe i have a responsibility to take care of my household and i think in america we tend to look at household as my kids, but I think at some point if my parents move in with me or become indigent and have to, then I do feel like I've got some some sort of responsibility there. Here's where that gets sticky in our current world. Most of the time I hear the question you're asking, one of two things is true. Number one, my the family is not asking for your help in any way. 
and you're watching somebody or a group of people you love literally kill themselves with their alcohol challenges or their um, struggles with addiction or whatever else is going, how they're spending their money, et cetera. And it's tough when you're watching your parents with health issues or financial issues or whatever, and they couldn't give two box of farts about what you think about that because they didn't ask you. Mm -hmm. And so that's usually number one. The other one, number two is you want to help, but they want that help on their terms. Mm -hmm. meaning they have a million dollar house and they're telling you they're broke and need help paying for stuff. And you say, I'll help, but you got to get out of the house. It's condo time because you don't have any money. And they're like, Nope, this is our family house. We've had this house for 30 years. This is our family house. And so that's where I think it's not your responsibility. I can find, I don't have any sort of scriptural or religious or biblical mandate to say your job is to prop up their lifestyle, whatever that looks like. You're their bank. Mm -hmm. But I do think sitting down with your husband and saying, okay, what would help look like? What would care look like? Is it giving them information? Is it giving them Financial Peace University? Is it providing them with $500 a month and you're going to help pay their bill? Like, What does help look like for you? And then go sit down with them and say, all right, here's what we're able and willing to do in this season. And when you're ready to talk about your struggles with alcohol, we're here. If you're ready to go to rehab, we're here. If you are ready to sell the house, we're here. But at some level, that's the best you could do. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Okay. So sorry you're going through this. Don't overextend yourself. Talk with your husband about what you're willing to do, what you're willing to commit to. And it says honor your father and mother. It doesn't say enable. And so do what you're comfortable with. And, uh, I mean, this is a tough situation. It may just be more supporting the family emotionally, being there for them. And part of that may be financial. Wow. Sorry to hear that. Work with your husband every step of the way as y'all as y'all decide what you're going to do together. Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. We're grateful you're here wherever you're listening. We are in so many places now, Spotify, YouTube, radio. You can watch us on TBN. And just to add another option for you guys, we are now streaming on Twitter. So if you want to watch The Ramsey Show on Twitter, it's a very similar feed to what you would get on YouTube, and you can catch it on Twitter streaming starting at 3 p.m., That's Central Time, Monday through Friday. I think it's Central Time. They didn't write the time zone for me, but I'm just going to make a wild assumption. So 3 p.m. Monday through Friday, you can catch us on Twitter. Just go to at Ramsey Show or twitter.com slash Ramsey Show. Hit the follow button there, get some notifications, and we will let you know when we are streaming the show over there. Just one more. You know, why not? Twitter's going big on video now. We We got the new Threads app from Instagram. John and I are just trying to keep up. It's exhausting, guys. Do we need another platform? No. But they gave it to us, and we John's using it. need fewer platforms. But John is on there. You can follow him on threads. I don't I'm, even know how I'm to find him. threading it up. He's threading it up. There we go. John wasn't on social media three years ago, and now he's obsessed. I'm a guru. Wow. All right. Hey, more <laughs> of your calls are coming up. 888-825-5225. Austin joins us up next in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Good place. What's going on, Austin? Hey, y'all. Thank you for taking my call. Um... Hey, so my main question is, should I convince my wife to get a job to help pay our mortgage? Um, And I've I've got a little bit of a backstory here. Um, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Basically, um, my parents have some land um, not very far from where I work. Um, I got married four years ago. Uh, I've got two kids, um, and I'm 24 years old. I'm debt-free, but we 
entered into an agreement with my parents that they would gift us some land if we built a house on it. And then um, that would be our piece of land. We would just have to pay for the house. Um, so I built the house myself, ended up saving about uh, a little over 50% of what it would have cost to buy one new. Um, and like I did all the electrical, plumbing, all that stuff myself. Wow. Um, and uh, so it's been a learning experience, a lot of YouTube. Um, but now I've kind of got myself in a hole where um, the the house is more expensive than I, I initially thought it was going to be. We kind of shot for $175,000. It's going to be closer to that $200,000. Um, we also were planning to build two years ago when the interest rates were 2.5%. Now they're 7%. Um, and it's about time to buy the house. We've almost finished it. And, uh, you know, I, my wife's a stay at home mom. Uh, she takes care of our two kids, uh, daycare in our area is about $800 a kid a month. Um, and I just don't know if it's worth it to, um, convince her to get, um, a job to help pay for the mortgage. Well, if you can figure out how to convince a wife, that's, I mean, you need to be hosting the show, man. I don't know that I can convince my wife. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the starts... title of your first book, and it's called So I Convinced My Wife, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough situation. What I would do is just start the conversation and say, hey, here's some options because I, I know you're feeling this too. Financially, we're in a bind here, and part of it is owning, hey, this is my fault. I got us into this. I had this idea that I was going to do this and it was going to be this much and I didn't do great math and it's put our family in a tough situation. Or the world changed underneath right. us while we were doing it, And right? mortgage interest rates are now triple what they were and so we need a solution here. One of the solutions is for you to work so that we can provide more income and it'll be more than we would be spending on daycare uh, or we'd have to put the kids in daycare so you'd have to bring in at least 1600 bucks take-home pay to make this worth it and that would allow us to cover this. What do you think about it? Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. It's just more of a question that I'm, I'm struggling with. Should I try to convince her um, rather than do I have to? Um, and so I, I know that we can make it work. Um, it, it is high. I mean, we're looking at probably 35 uh, percent of take home pay uh, to the mortgage, uh, which I know is is really tough. And I know that I'd like to keep it to that 25 percent. But but it's kind of this I, I you know, I screwed up, you know, and, and I'm kind of in this situation now. And what's and, your uh, income? But, you know, uh, so I, I'm at about 62,000. What can I tell you? How old are you again? 24. Can I tell you something that will change your entire life? If you learn yeah. this at 24, what it took me to learn into my 40s, I'm going to give you two decades of your of your life and your marriage back, and you're going to become a pillar in your community, and you're going to become the husband that your wife has always dreamed you could be. And I know that's quite a setup. Are you wow. in? I'm in. I want you to sit down and tell her exactly what you just told me and George. Honey, I saw a dream in front of us and my parents made us a good deal. And I went for this and I missed and I'm scared to death. And here's a couple of options. I would love it if you would sit down and dream with me on, and come together because I'm carrying a lot of shame. Because I feel like we had agreement that we were going to do this 25% thing. The world spun underneath us. I kept building this thing ballooned on me in price and cost, and now I'm scared to death, and I can't breathe, and I'm sorry. And what you're going to give her is the gift, not of weakness and cowardly nonsense. You're giving her vulnerability. You're giving her honesty and integrity, and you're letting her in on the guy she married, which is just something that doesn't happen. And, man, give her an opportunity to speak into what happens next. And from that place, at that breakfast or at that lunch y'all are having, then you can sit down and say, okay— if you get a job, $1,600 off the top goes to take care of our kids. What job can you make $3,500 a month or $4,000 a month? And how long would you have to do that? Like, Be real specific on how long we would do this. Come up with a plan. And also say, or it's just going to be tight for a few years. And then we're going to refinance when the interest rates go down. But if you start with that, you don't need to convince her of anything. You need to sit down and say, here's what I did and here's how I feel about it. And will you work with me on, on digging out? 
See how, see the difference there? One is I'm right and I got to get her into this place. The other is coming with hands wide open saying, I screwed this thing up and I love you so much. And will you work with me on making this right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that's awesome. I would even write it down because it's going to be weird and hard to do. I'd write it down and read that letter. That's very romantic yeah. too. It's not very romantic at all, actually. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's romantic. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think a handwritten letter is very nice. I mean, you don't want to hand it to her. No, you just read it out loud. Say, I, I wrote this. It's that important to me. I George, want to write George this would text this, by the way. He would just text it. Snapchat it. Honey, I messed up. LOL. Shake Rolls. it off. Emojis. Emojis. Oh, yeah, exactly. But, yeah, I think uh, it's more about reframing this. I need to convince her to, we have to come up with some options. Yeah, and it's I'm going to go effort. I'm going to go first. Hey, let me ask you one quick question, Austin. When, you, when your folks gave you this land, did they... Did they deed it over to you? Do you have a copy of this is my land and I've got the paperwork and they've got it they've got it sectioned off and everything with the county? Um, they do have it sectioned off, but it's not in my name yet. Um, when I purchased the house, they were going to deed it over to me. Okay. I would not rest until that's done. Because unfortunately, George and I have done this show long enough that People come into agreements with their parents and they build a house and then dad's like, oh, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And then dad passes away or dad leaves or dad changes his mind or dad gets laid off and he needs the land for something else. And then he charges you for it. Or you see what I'm saying? It just gets messy. And I know that yeah, probably isn't your parents, but man, it's good to have everything nice and clean. Yeah. A lot of the calls in this show are my parents did this and there was a family agreement and then it all went sideways. Right. And so we're just looking ahead for you. The other option, Austin, is what if you could make up the gap with your income? whether that's increasing your job full-time or getting a side job to make up that 10% gap in take-home pay. Yeah, yeah, that that's a good option too, yeah. And, and again, and when let you, her know, that's an option. Well, yeah, <laughs> when you're sitting down with your wife saying, here's an option, you go back to work, you'd have to make a bunch of money, or here's another jo- option, I'm going to take a second job until at least I can get us up to this much of a down payment so that we can avoid X, Y, and Z. All those things are, are on the table when you sit down and say... Will you join me in this new adventure? Yeah, I'll take options over ultimatums any day. I think the conversation's going to go a whole lot better versus I got to convince you to do this, and if you don't, we're screwed. So thanks for the call, man. Wishing you guys the best through this home-building journey. That puts this hour of The Ramsey Show in the books. Hey, George Camel here. If you love the show and you want a deeper dive on your money journey, we've got a weekly newsletter that gives you helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for the newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods, moving, and storage studio, it's The Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create amazing relationships. I'm George Camel, joined by my good friend, Dr. John Deloney, and we are pumped to take your calls at 888-825-5225. If you need a little help, a little advice to take the right next step with your life, your money, your relationships, your mental health, whatever it is, we want to attempt to do that for you today. Daniel kicks us off in San Jose. Daniel, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call today. Sure. How can we help? Yeah, so I'm a worship and media director at a local church here, and my wife and I are expecting our first child. Congrats. She, thank you. Yeah, she has had some complications, and we've experienced some pretty big financial hits this year. So she is, is out of work until she's due. So my question is, I'm definitely called into the ministry. However, with these financial hits, um, is it worth us, uh, is it worth myself going and looking for another job um, and leaving the ministry, looking for part-time uh, we just uh, we really don't know uh, what steps to take, especially when we uh, feel called into ministry. When you when you say I feel called, what does that mean? I believe that the Lord has has designed me to be a worshipper and a worship leader. Okay, and 
that's that's my role at the church is to lead people into worship and communion with him okay what about um what's your calling at home how would you describe that a husband and soon to be father and provider for the home okay so th- th- at some level if we distill it all the way down there's there's a conflict between those two callings that you feel right yep yep so what i would suggest is this um if I was to label a call that I had in my life, I would say it's to help people have a little bit better day after they've interacted with me than before. And when I was younger, I attached a call to a job, to a title. And I started realizing that ministry is done outside of a church just as well as it's done and as much as it's done inside of a church. In fact, they're, 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 it's everywhere. It's how I treat the waitress. It's how I honor my wife and my kids. It's how I take care of my friend George when he screws something up. It's, mm. it's a way of being. And so my challenge for you would be, A, ask yourself, and this is for you and your theological um, mind to, to sit down and, and work through, is God calling you to a job over um, taking care of your wife and kids in this season? Because the money you're making at this job is not paying your bills. Correct. Or can you be a person who brings people closer together, who connects people, whether you work at Burger King or whether you work on a stage at a church or whether you work changing tires at a local whatever or you're a, a, a counselor, can your call expand to I'm a person who brings people together? That's what I do. And if I somebody hands me a guitar and puts me on a stage, that's what I do it. If somebody, you know, hands me a wrench, I'm going to turn it. I'm going to make sure that guy and his family have a safe car to go on their vacation. I'm going to bring that family together. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so when I started looking for my quote unquote call, which is a whole other conversation, George, that I think we in our culture just got sideways. Um, I went looking for a job description and podcasting and YouTube did not exist. It wasn't, a, it didn't, it wasn't hadn't been invented yet. And so I've learned that here's what I really think I'm good at. And here's what I think I'm, um, have, I've spent 25 years trying to be good at this thing, like learning the craft of this thing, whether it's on the radio, whether Dave fires me tomorrow and I go do it in, in a counseling office or I go back to be a professor, whatever it is, I just am going to continue to want people to be a little more peaceful after they meet with me, right? Mm. I, th- I think that the idea of call expands much beyond job description, right? Yeah. But yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard, hard de- decision. I also think this, man, if you choose to step away for a season, A, it's not forever, and B, grieve it. You're going to miss it. You get to play yeah. music every week, right? You get to write music and sit with hurting people. Like that, That's something that you love to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. So tactically, Daniel, I see there's a few options here. Number one, I think we need to go to church leadership and tell them honestly your situation. Not with any expectation, but just to let them know, hey, here's what's going on. I don't want to leave this place, but right now I need to go pay some bills and I'm looking into some part-time jobs. And that's option one is you work there full time and you take on a part-time job, which could affect, you know, your family because you're gone and your wife is going through it right now. Or... You leave the ministry, maybe you do that part-time as a volunteer at the church, and you work full-time in a different role right now until you guys get yeah. some financial stability. And then maybe one day the role opens back up or it's still there and you go back to doing what you love. That's how I see it. I always like to give myself options, even if I don't love all of them. Yeah, that's good. And I'll also pass this along again. I, I, I'll, I'm sure I'll get peop- an earful of other people's theology, but... Um, I had a mentor of mine one time. I was I was young. I was young. I was in my twenties, and I was back and forth and trying to find what God was asking me to do here and here and here. And I was all over the place. And he said something that was pretty transformative for me. And he said, "Has it ever occurred to you that maybe God doesn't care what you do? He just cares who you are on the way it is to wherever it is you're going." And mm. that was a, a significant shift for me. Because I think of the people all over the earth who are in hellacious situations um, and ask myself, are they being called to a three-car garage? Are they being called to 
be a person of honor and integrity and uphold their whatever their religious values are in the face of great oppression, in the face of in the face of great fear, in the face of God knows what. Right. And so this idea of call becomes a much more expansive thing than um, yeah. I have to work at this building at this job. That's just my thoughts, yeah. man. I could be way out to lunch. One man's opinion. There's people pulling over, screaming and yelling all over America right now. That guy's an idiot. Heretic. But, but how, even then, how does that sit with you, man? That's great. What no. are you leaning towards? <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thanks, guys. <laughs> if you we hang no, up, no, what are you going to go do? You know, I actually uh, have a meeting plan to talk to our leadership. Um. But I, I do feel that we need to we need to get some more income coming in. Cool. Do you have another option? Like if you had to go get a new job tomorrow, what would it be? You know, I don't have uh, I don't really have that lined up, but I'm willing to go flip burgers if that's what it means. I know? knew you would. Hang on the line. I'm going to send you um, my my buddy Ken Coleman his Get Clear assessment that can give you some options to say, okay, here's what I'm really good at. Here's what I love doing. Here's what I think I've been called to do. And here are a million different places where I might be able to do those very things that I've never even thought of. Hang on the line here. We'll get it sent over to you on on us. Blessings to you, brother. Congratulations on this new baby. Well, you've all played the telephone game. The first person whispers a message to the second person who whispers it to the third and so on around the table until the original message has completely changed. Multiply that confusion by a hundred if you run a business with different software systems that don't talk to each other. That's why there's NetSuite by Oracle. In the early days of Ramsey, we were using different systems for all of our business units. We needed one single source for accurate data. NetSuite was the software we used to optimize and take us to the next level. NetSuite gave us the visibility into all of our numbers so that we could communicate across departments and plan ahead better. And as we grew, it scaled with us. NetSuite worked for Ramsey, and it will make a difference for your business too. Join the more than 34,000 customers who trust NetSuite to help make them smarter and make better decisions and level up their operations. To learn more, get a free product tour at netsuite.com slash Ramsey. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. I'm George Camel. He's Dr. John Deloney. This is The Ramsey Show. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Well, John, a piece of news crossed our desk, and we are not uh, men of the news, but we report news that I think is eye-opening to our viewers and listeners and helps them make good choices with their money, which is why I share this article from consumerfinance.gov. CFPB takes action against Bank of America for illegally charging junk fees, withholding credit card rewards, and opening fake accounts. And the CFPB, which is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, if you're not in with the cool kids, they ordered Bank of America to pay more than $100 million to customers for systematically double-dipping on fees imposed on them with insufficient funds in their account, withholding those reward bonuses, uh, which they were promised to, and misappropriating sensitive personal information in order to open accounts without the customer's authorization or knowledge. Wow. This is dark stuff. I mean, this is some Wells Fargo level stuff. And I, I, you know, it doesn't surprise me that's from Bank of America, which is probably the next worst bank out there. But <laughs> you said that gracious. so dramatically. It's Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> like they're like. Oh they're, my gosh, this is sad. I, I, I think until the banking industry decides to align incentives across the board, 
right? And what I mean by that is we're talking about it off air. If person X has an incentive and they have no skin in the game down the road, they're going to do whatever they can to meet their incentive in their local market, right? And on and on and on it goes down the road until you get an entire culture where cutting corners, making numbers for the end of the the quarterly um, returns, it just becomes a huge mess. Oh, man. This is wild. So to un- fully understand what happened here. There it goes. Yeah, sales to meet to meet now so disbanded the, sales goals. So here's, here's how it happens. Explain this. So you have a local teller who is told if you get this many open accounts, then you get a bonus. That person doesn't have to deal with any of the accounts, doesn't manage the account. That, that's my job. I will get you 10. And then it gets to the end of the month, and somebody comes in and opens a checking account. And there's no skin off anybody's nose if he goes ahead and just opens a savings account and a money market account as well. And I get to book three. I got three. Well, then let's say that savings account has a, a minimum. And then this person gets a, a bill, right, for $10 because you didn't have the minimum of an account you didn't open. And then the next teller opens it and goes, well, you opened it on this date. And it just snowballs that way, right? Mm. And that person gets his, gets his thing. Then the person collecting overdraft fees gets theirs. And it rolls all the way up. It's the same as back in the mortgage, the the, the mortgage backed securities issue. The bank who made the loan to that mortgage didn't have to hold the payoff. They sold it right away. So they had no in, they, they the only care. incentive was to make the loan. Not can this guy actually pay this loan back someday? I don't care about that. I'm selling the sucker. I just need to make the loan today. And if you keep passing the buck, passing the buck, and everybody doesn't have skin in the game, you get these big, huge collapses where the whole thing falls over, man. Ugh. Or you get big, systematic, cultural schemes like this kind of nonsense, man. That's pretty wild that the employees illegally applied for and enrolled co- consumers in credit card accounts without their knowledge or authorization. They, in some cases, illegally used or obtained consumers' credit reports without their permission to complete applications. So the customer hadn't even completed the application, like... You have an account now. Here's your line of credit. Goodness gracious, that's frightening. And this is not the first time uh, they've got a little slap on the wrist to the tune of a few million. In 2014, the CFPB ordered Bank of America to pay $727 million in redress to its victims for illegal credit card practices. In May of 2022... They had to pay $10 million in a civil penalty over unlawful garnishments. And later in 2022, because they didn't learn their lesson, another $225 million that, and required it to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in redress to consumers for botched disbursement of state unemployment benefits at the height of COVID-19. Well, and, and it makes me think this. The bank has, uh, as of March 31st, two, $2.4 trillion dollars in consolidated assets and $1.9 trillion in domestic deposits, right? So that's oh. a four, four and a half-ish trillion dollar bank. So these fines, you're like $700 million. You're like, eh. Cool. Where do I send, where do I send the check, right? Um, and it's that again, these little slap on the wrist, $100 million, which sounds like the end of time for you and me, is like, okay, that's the price of doing business when you're making $4 trillion, right? Yeah. So the, the lesson learned here, number one, don't do business with Wells Fargo or Bank of America or any of these big, scummy companies. Uh, we love local community banks, credit unions. That's a great place to do your banking locally. And uh, another piece of this is don't play with debt because they are snakes and they will get you. And I have a healthy distrust of banks because their name is stamped all over stadiums and the biggest buildings downtown and your name isn't. And that tells me they're winning. So when they're marketing to you with all these sweet commercials and there's like smiling families and they're telling you how they can get you a great deal on a loan, run away. It is a horror movie waiting to happen. I don't know. Any other advice there, John, when it comes to banking? This is just, it's just sad. And we've been talking, we've been talking trash about these folks for years now. No, it's just until, until. But switching your bank is so much, people are like, eh, it's too much work. It's worth the work to get out from under these guys. This, this just reminds me of, you know, the, the industry that I love, higher ed, until people get serious about making it right, it's going to continue to help some people and really hurt other people mm. and it's just gonna man it's one of those things man i wish we could just get in there and solve the problem before it becomes so catastrophic that you have to rebuild something out of ash yeah it doesn't have to be that way but here we are there we go all right let's go to the phones michael's up next in huntsville alabama michael welcome to the show hey guys how's it going Thanks great for taking my call sure what's going on with you 
Hey, well, um, I'll get try to get straight to my point. Uh, a lot came available in, in a neighborhood that my wife and I are, uh, is highly desirable for us, and we're trying to figure out if we want to sell our, our current residence, our house, and uh, start a construction loan and temporarily move into an apartment while the house is being built. And then uh, once the house is built, uh, just have the primary mortgage on the new property and the new uh, new lot. Okay, sounds reasonable so far. Do you guys have the money to do all this? Well, we would we would definitely have to sell our house uh, to start the the construction loan. Um, okay, so that's a big move. Only, but what would the net profit be if you sold the house? What would you get after fees and paying off the mortgage? Uh, we would probably get around two hundred thousand out of my house in net profit. Uh, we could sell it for about three hundred, and we we owe about eighty on it right now. Cool. So you have two hundred to put down. What would yeah. that mean for your construction loan and the primary mortgage later on? Well, the primary mortgage later on, we're looking around probably um, uh, probably around a four hundred thousand dollar house, um, give or take. You know, we have to buy the lot. Uh, the lot's about ninety thousand. Uh, so, so you're talking we're half a million right now. Yes, about about five hundred thousand, and give right. or take in total. Yes. Okay, and you have two hundred of that. Yes, we have 200 of that. So that would leave you with about a 300,000 mortgage once this is all said and done? Yep, uh, about a $300,000 mortgage uh, once we get everything finalized after we've stayed in the apartment for, uh, I guess, a year or so. And what's your income? Uh, our income right now, uh, gross, is about 170000 Awesome. 165000 Great income. Okay, so what is your concern in all of this? Well, we're just concerned with the market, you know, with the the interest rates and how how high it was uh, is. We we tried to buy a house about a year ago, and and it kind of fell through because we were just kind of nervous about uh, getting out and selling our house, and then getting a higher interest rate uh, with the way the market's going. Because we we bought our house in 2019 right before all uh, the craziness happened, and we're just kind of scared to, I guess, jump off into the deep end. Give you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I don't want you to make this huge decision based off of the interest rate being higher or lower. I want you to make the decision because okay. you're ready for it financially, and it's what you guys really want to do. Okay. So I would jump onto our mortgage calculator at RamseySolutions.com. You're probably looking at, I want you to do a 15-year fix where the payment's no more than a quarter of your take-home pay. I think you guys can get there with this income if that's stable, and this could be a great move for you. It's obviously a lot of work. You're going to sell the thing. you got to go rent. It's going to take more time than you think. It's going to be more expensive than you think, but it doesn't sound unreasonable. John, did I miss anything? All right, we did it. We solved at least one problem today right here on The Ramsey Show. This is The Ramsey Show. I'm George Camel, joined by Dr. John Deloney. We are grateful you are joining us right now. And if you're enjoying the show, I would ask you to do one thing. It's a free show. What I'm asking you to do is completely free, and it's easy, it's quick, and that is to share the show. Please consider subscribing. Hit the follow button wherever you're hanging out with us. Leave a review, and uh, especially share this with people in your life that you love, people that you want to see win in every area, whether that's money, relationships, mental health, or career. That's what this show is all about, and uh, I was talking to a a fan that was out there visiting John, he was like, I don't watch the news anymore. I just watch the Ramsey show and my life is just better. Because I, just, There's no question about that. We don't do a lot of uh, if it bleeds, it leads kind of headlines around here. The callers call in with their questions and we yeah, try to help There's plenty them. of blood on the show as is. Yeah, we don't need any more of that. And so uh, we appreciate all of you who have shared this with people and you never know what impact you're going to have. That one episode could spark something in their life to where transformation happens, and uh, we're grateful for all of that. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's go to Austin in Dallas up next. Austin, welcome to the show. 
Hey, thanks for taking my call, guys. Sure. What's going on? Yeah, so um, I, just, I don't know if it's pretty simple or not, but um, I have a mortgage. Uh, it started, it was a $382,000 property, and I put 20% down. Um, so there's about 300 left on the mortgage. And I have a family member that could help me pay off that mortgage. And so I was trying to figure out if that's a good idea or not and if that would be the best use of their money. But and if so, what would be like a the best fair way to go about doing that? That was the, uh, that was the vaguest way you could have described that. <laughs> be a little more specific. Yeah, what was this conversation like? Did they bring this up? Did you bring it up? Is this a gift? Is it, Is it your a loan? dad? Is it some weird cousin that's going to expect stuff? Tell us more. <laughs> uh, no, it would be uh, my, one of my parents, my mom, and you know, just uh, collectively my parents. And then they would. She just. My mom has some savings, and she's looking to do something with that savings, but she's not quite sure. Uh, what we must come from different it. households because some savings and she has an extra 300 grand laying around is a very different scenario. That's amazing. She has done very well. Uh, yeah, she's put in a lot of work over a long period of time. Is this a large part of her world and her – is this retirement? Where is the savings coming from and what would she use it on instead of this? I'm not quite sure what – it would be a significant – portion of her you know total wealth right um but at least i mean somewhere i'm I'm not quite sure how did this come up man she and i were just talking about it and she knows that i have a mortgage i just got the house not too long ago and she would use her funds to either purchase another rental property um purchase a home or a property and you know try to have her money grow that way Here's why I don't like this. I don't like it because you don't have peace in your spirit about it. There's something about this that has given you pause, whether you're wondering if mom actually has this money, whether um, sometimes parents give gifts and it's their way of putting hooks deeper in their kids, or um, you don't want to be responsible for something down the road. I don't know what it is, but you don't have peace in your spirit about this. I got no problem with parents who want to surprise their kids and pay off their house. I think that's amazing. I would love to be in that financial position to do that for my kids someday. Um, but that doesn't sound like the case here. It would be just more, is that the best use of her money? You don't, and... you don't like, this sounds weird. I don't think you get a vote in how she uses her money. Right. Um, And truthfully, the better use of the money for her without you being involved is she goes and invests this money in a mutual fund and it becomes her retirement plan. So I don't think it's about is this the best use. If this is just a gift out of her heart and she says, I have this money, it's not going to affect my retirement. It's not going to affect my financial world. I just want to bless you with it. That's amazing. But I don't know that that's the case here. And that's the piece that gives us pause. Right. Well, I think that you know, I it would I would be treated at the very least as like a gift. So I'd want to return that to her over a period of time. See, that's what it worries me. A gift doesn't. If John gives me a gift, this is a big old loan that she wants an ROI on. D- just say no, thank you, mom. I love you too much. I'd walk away. Now. Yeah. Or okay. it's hey, remember yeah. that time I paid off your mortgage? Now take care of me for the rest of my life because I don't have any retirement. Well, when, and I'm broke. The, the way you just said that put the puzzle piece together for me. It sounds like she's gonna go get a rental property and expect cash back. Or she's going to pay your mortgage off, and instead of you paying your mortgage to the mortgage company, you're going to pay mom, right? Or when you sell it, she goes, okay, I'd like my 300 now because I kind of need it. I'd love to get a rental property with it. And you go, whoa, I thought that was my money because it was a gift. Yeah. So I think th- I'd be totally fine with that, though, because I think that that would be fair, right? Like, but you don't you know what the future holds. In. No, because then it's just a big, long loan. It's just a loan yeah. with no interest. Right, now, and that's where the question, like, what is the best and most fair way to handle it would be but not handling it all might be the solution i i i'm telling you what i would do in my house i would say thank you so much for the offer it means the world to me um i want to be all grown up and so i'm going to go through the process and do this myself and if i've got total peace in my spirit about something then i'm all in but you don't have that i don't have that for you and it sounds like there's going to be some strings attached to this that's just going to muddy the relationship between a father i mean a son and his mother and man, let's keep that as, as, as pure as possible. It's one of the most important relationships you'll ever have. Well said.
retweet. Thanks for the call, Austin. Zach is up next in Kansas City. Zach, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, George and John. Thanks for taking my call. Yeah. What's up, man? Well, uh, we're new to Financial Peace University, my wife and I. We just started our classes this week. Awesome. Um, We've got our budget plan in place and all that. Uh, We've got a two-year-old son and a daughter on the way. Um, We're exiting the Army pretty soon after seven years and traveling back to St. Louis to be a part of a family business. And we have other entrepreneurships we do as well. But um, we have the option to live with my in-laws until we find a house or take on a mortgage. Um, But I'd like to try and pay cash for a piece of property and then build or pay for it as we go and as we can afford it. Um, Currently, we don't have any debt and almost 50 grand in the bank. but it's going it's to put some stress on my in-laws, I'm sure. They love us and their grandkids, and they're willing to house us until we're ready to move somewhere. And with the current housing situation, I'm hesitant to buy a home. I just want to see what y'all thought of it. Hmm. So did they invite you, or did you ask them, hey, we're exiting the military. Would you guys be cool with us living with, with you for a while? Yeah, we had a family sit-down discussion, and... Um, it, it, you know, as a as a father and a uh, provider for my family, it's it's kind of hard for me to be willing to to live with someone. With, in, like I should be able to provide, right? I should be able to afford to home, you know, my family and stuff. So it's kind of I'd like to be able to just go and buy a house, but I'm, I'm I don't want to take on a mortgage if I don't have to, and then I can potentially set us up for real financial success. You know, but they, they're if you're still married, <laughs> right. yeah, no. if you're still married after living with your in-laws and your little kids, based on how you said this, it's going to put stress on them. You've got another little baby on the way. This is going to be chaos. And so I would you're not throwing away money by renting for a year as you continue to save up a down payment. And if you want to pay cash, that's great. I wouldn't sit on the sidelines for the next 10 years as you wait to save up, save up cash. So if you can do this quickly. That's a plan, but otherwise, I'd wait till you can afford a 15-year fixed rate where the payment's no more than a quarter of your take-home pay. And let me say, I'll even go one step further, George. If this is you saying no just because of your ego, Zach, I'm a provider, and I'm a man, and you have an you have an opportunity to fast forward the financial future of your life, of, of your family's life significantly by just sucking it up for six months and you and your wife and your mother-in-law and your father-in-law sit down and draw up some things in writing. I don't have a problem with it. I have a problem with it if you're going to be moping around and, and uh, uh, the whole time. There's no end date on this thing and it just turns into four months, turns into eight months, turns into a year, turns into it never ends, right? So if there's some clarity there and it's just your ego, I don't have a super big problem with it, but I'm with George, man. It sounds like the right move is to go rent a place, a tiny little place that y'all can suck it up and, and, and manage it until y'all can get that house. Yeah, I've just rarely had people call in and say, we live with our in-laws for a year and it was just amazing and it was the best thing ever. It's always like, we live with our in-laws because we tried to save money. So, tread with caution. Thanks. This is The Ramsey Show. Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. Our scripture of the day comes from Proverbs 27.1. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Martin Short once said, if you have wonderful moments, don't second guess them, just enjoy them. I like that. Just be present, John. Have you ever tried that for once? <laughs> I love Martin Short. Good guy. Good. I don't, I'm not friends with him. I don't know him, but I'd love to be. Martin, if you're listening. Appreciate that. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Tyler's up next in Jackson, Mississippi. Tyler, what's going on? Hey, uh, no, I was just trying to call because um, I'm I'm young and I've kind of gotten to this bad, I guess, ending with just being money and I, I make a lot. And I, I didn't really grow up making a lot and I was just trying to see what all, you know, you, y'all give me advice on. Um, 
I work for the railroad. Uh, I started at, I mean, I, I turned 19 right when I started in, in, the, in the industry. Um, I make around 123000 a year. That's not including overtime or any of the benefits paid. Um, and I don't have any debt other than one car I recently bought about a year ago, and that was just so I know I can get back and forth to work. Um, and other than that, that's the only debt I have. That's probably around $25,000. Uh, but I've just obviously noticed you know, every other paycheck is I get paid twice a month that I'm living paycheck to paycheck and I just don't know where this money is going other than me just blowing it because I never had it. Um, and everybody gives me advice and I just was trying to see what all y'all had to say about it. Well, dude, I, I, I've got my opinions on the railroad, man. So I'm, I, I know the work you do is hard and it is unforgiving. And I actually understand when you say I got to get a car cause I can't not show up cause I know about right. all that mess. Um, can you, if, if George and I walk you through this, will you make us a promise that you will never listen to knuckleheaded advice from somebody in the yard ever again? Yeah, I promise. All right. Cause this is, you've been listening to them and here we are, right? So you're going to listen to two knuckleheads right. on the radio instead. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So you told Fair us, enough. you're like, I don't know where my money's going, man. I get these paychecks and they disappear and they're big paychecks. Give us some guesses right. as to where the money is going. If you had to rank them from most frivolous, here's where I know it's going to least, give me like the top three categories. Okay. Uh, let's say uh, we. I still live at home with parents. Me and my girlfriend both live at home with, 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 my, with my parents. Uh, we like to go kind of get out of their way and we go – out and eat that's a big thing eating um, out yeah and then um just trying to live being young we go to you know water parks or places like that um you know and things that you know you, you wouldn't think that cost that much but just going out just enjoying the time we have um i'd say i'd say like you're just going and paying for like water parks or museums <laughs> or like that or, tra- or traveling i guess would be a good way to say it um and then whenever I actually have the time off, is going to get two off days a week. Yeah. Um, so where I mean, you don't then, even have rent, and you're blowing 120 grand a year. What's your right. car payment? I, I, uh, I pay 595 dollars a month on my car. Okay, so that's one place your money's going. That's a big chunk. In my insurance, I pay for, unfortunately, mine and my mother's vehicle, and it's around. Um, it's about five hundred dollars a month as well. So technically, I'd say it's about a nine hundred dollar payment because you really had, had to go because you have to. All right, that insurance. ends August fifteenth. Oh. Here's why: you're gonna get out and get yourself an apartment. You make one hundred twenty three thousand dollars. No more living at mommy's house. Okay. Right. right. You, you know what helps you stop spending when you have real bills like rent to pay. And that goes, uh, you know, we can't eat out as much because we got to pay rent. Yes, but you get out of mommy's yeah. house from this point forward, okay? And here's here's right. why I'm telling you that. You're changing your family tree. And right. if you and girlfriend, girlfriend's <laughs> loving the fact that you've won the lottery, making $125,000 a year. Your parents are loving the fact that you made $125,000. I mean, this sounds like a movie. You hear that, right? Oh, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. All right. You have to decide, I'm done with this life. I'm going to get my own place. I'm going to start budgeting my money. I am going to take control of this because I have a lottery ticket. And by the way, there will come a time... When the railroad slows way, way, way down. It is right now. We're actually, they, they just started changing our schedule. They're going to start, and, and you're going to be sweeping uh, the yard really, for yeah, a quarter right. of your I mean, hourly it, pay, yeah. right? Or you're going to have mm-hmm. to, I, I've got somebody that I love and care about who had to go move to another city to get work. Right. So yeah. that they could they right. could get on, on the board. So here's the thing. You're going to have to create some, a significant savings really like a farmer because there's years when it rains right. and years when it doesn't right right do you have any money right. in the bank right now to be honest no I Tyler really you I got mean, no it, bills it, it, I know okay <laughs> I know Here, here's what we need to do Number one, this car needs to get paid off as soon as possible. I'm not going to tell you to sell it because I think you can pay it off quickly with this income. But that means, yeah, we, this you know, what's your take home pay? Are you getting seven grand a month? Uh, I say, let's see. It's usually about anywhere from 
three thousand to all, close to four check. So I'd say seven, so I'm spot or, on. I'd say about seventy five hundred to eight thousand a month. Okay, so here's what we need to do. We need to start sending six grand a month to that car lender. Six thousand a month, you hear? Oh yeah. Which six, means yeah. we're gonna cover insurance and is is covering mom's insurance long term? Is this like a quid pro quo because you're not paying rent or what? Um uh, it's yeah. I, you know, it, yeah, kind of. I mean, it's literally one of those where well, you don't, you know, you live here so you can help do this kind of thing, right? That's why you don't live there no um, more. That's why you do not live there. Yeah, yeah. So it's you're not really living rent free when you owe someone else's insurance payment. So right, that's number right. one. We got to start throwing a whole bunch of money at this car loan debt snowball. You only have one loan. You said that's it. Your only debt. That's it. And I, mean, using, I have like one credit card. There it's like it is. Two hundred dollar limit. You know what's going to help your spending? But, but, Cutting up that credit card and sticking to cash and debit cards. I'm telling right, you, yeah. that changes the game. Because when you swipe right. that debit card and it's your own money, you think differently. When you hand over another hundred dollar bill at the grocery store when you're it's eating out, true. it hits right. differently. So those are the two things you yeah. got to do today. The other thing I'm going to do is gift you, if you're willing to use it, you got to promise me you're going to use it, is every dollar premium. That is our budgeting tool, and it has all these awesome features like paycheck planning. It connects to your bank account. You can drag up all the transactions into the categories, and this needs to be like your new hobby, is just tracking transactions, everything you spend. And if it's not in the budget, because you said you're going to spend $200 on groceries this month, then it doesn't happen. And by the way, when you're in debt, you're not eating out. you got one singular goal, and it's to get out of that car debt. And that's going to make your girlfriend right. hate you, isn't it? <laughs> like, yeah, it used to be so fun. We used to go out and have fun. You're like, yeah, I'm broke. I have no expenses, and I still can't make my paychecks work, which means if you want to be with a man who can take care of you, he's got to figure his crap out, right? All right, now, and hey, yeah. I want you to hear what I'm going to say because um, I've been making jokes and laughing. I'm being very serious, okay? Okay. Upwards of 70% of lottery winners go bankrupt. Wow. Millions and millions of dollars, and they go bankrupt. They lose everything. Wow. Be- because of two reasons. Number one, they did not come up with a plan for their money. And all right. those millions and millions of dollars did was magnify who they already were. And who they already were was someone who just spends recklessly and spends money they don't got and takes out loans and gets whatever they want and doesn't say no and all that stuff. The second right. reason people who win the lottery go bankrupt is they're surrounded by leeches. People who want a piece and want a piece and want a piece. And I'll even go a third, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say altruistically, it feels good when you just pick up the tab for everybody, doesn't it? It feels awesome. Right, yeah. And when you can take your girl out anywhere y'all want to go, we're going to go to the Sizzler tonight, honey. And she's like, all right, no more Arby's for us. We're going to Golden Corral, right? I mean, it feels awesome, right? Right, right, right. People get used to that. It becomes an entitlement. And then it's, hey, will you pick up my insurance? Hey, you got to pay groceries. Hey, you got to pay the light bill because suddenly you're everybody else's cash register. So I want you to take the stuff George has given you for free and internalize it in your soul and come up with a plan for this money. So a decade from now, the entire family tree you come from is different because you made six figures and you worked that money in, uh, you were intentional with that money. Hang on the line. We'll gift you one year of every dollar premium. That puts this hour of The Ramsey Show in the books. Until next time, spend wisely, save intentionally, and give generously. Hey, it's Dr. John Deloney. If you like what you heard in this episode and want to know more about getting started on the Ramsey Baby Steps, go to RamseySolutions.com and click on the Get Started button. We'll help you figure out the best next step for you based on your specific situation. That's RamseySolutions.com and click Get Started.